and anybody else you see here that's volunteering. Primarily, most people that volunteer wear a Hope Project shirt. If you see that shirt, you're going to see a smiling face of someone that loves you. It's going to show you love. And so we're just excited you're here. But hey, if you came in today and uh, you did not stop by the, the New Here tent, there's a big sign that says New Here. Um, we'd love for you to stop by afterwards and uh, talk to somebody there. We want to get to know you a little bit. We want to give you a free gift for being our first time guest. And uh, man, we just want to get some information from you so we can follow up with you and, and serve you. Because that's what this is about, guys. What we do on Monday night is kind of an extension uh, of what we do throughout the week. We follow up with you. We see how we can help, how we can pray, um, and just what we can do to, uh, to serve you better. So if you noticed, we are in a different location. I'm sure you did notice because you drove here. Um, so we are not at Seacoast this week. And man, praise God for this band that came in and made it happen. worked if it hadn't been for these amazing people that came in and did it. Um, so yeah, we are in a different location this week, but next week, December 9th, we're going to be back at Seacoast in West Ashley, so make sure you know that. And then the following three weeks of December, we're going to be back in this very space right here. Um, so the reason we aren't able to be at Seacoast during December, a lot of people have asked. They got a lot of Christmas stuff going on and they don't want a whole lot of people in there. I get it. Christmas is crazy for church world. Uh, so anyway, I want to talk about giving, guys. You know, one thing that, that we always ask to do is if this ministry has blessed you, we would love for you um, to give. Um, now, it's giving of your time, giving of your talent, and giving of your treasures. A lot of you have been coming for a while, man. I'd love to see you take a step into our community and volunteer. One thing that we really ask for people to do is, hey, if you've been coming for a while, take a step in. Because once you start volunteering with people and you get in the trenches, you start getting to know people and getting to love people. So I would love for you to do that. But also, does everybody know that tomorrow is Giving Tuesday? Does everybody know what Giving Tuesday is? So basically, this this uh, this thing called Facebook, I'm sure you never heard of it. Um, so Facebook on Giving Tuesday, December 3rd, they match dollar for dollar anything you give to a 501c3 nonprofit. So if you go on Facebook tomorrow and give your best gift because this ministry has blessed you, um, they are going to match that dollar for dollar. So we would love for instead of going to the hopeproject.cc forward slash give, go ahead and save that tonight. And then tomorrow morning at 8 a.m., Eastern Standard Time, uh, they're going to open that up. So it's a hundred thousand dollar limit for each nonprofit, and it's a seven million dollar payout for the whole day. So it's going to go quick. So if you want to do that, set your alarm and give, and we would be so thankful, guys. Because if you look around, this stuff costs money. It costs money to do this, and so um, the only reason I'm able to ask is because I give myself. I give into this ministry because I believe in it. So I would love for you to pray for and consider that in the next 12 hours so you can do that at 8 a.m. tomorrow morning. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so our guest today um, is, is Cookie Cawthorn. And man, let me just tell you a little bit about Cookie because, you know, we talked about we really wanted to set, set the stage for a year and, and set the culture and guard the culture. And then we really prayed through who were the people that we wanted to kind of come after that year and bring the message. And, you know, Chris Dew was one because he loves the wild ones. He loves us. And, and Cookie Cawthorn is one, too, because she loves the wild ones. We call the wild ones our people, the people that Jesus came for. And, yeah, come on. We can clap for that. Yeah. And so uh, I just want to tell a little backstory about Cookie. In 2011, uh, when I received Jesus at his church, uh, I was hungry, y'all. Like, when Jesus saved me, I was like, I need to know more about this guy named Jesus. I need to know more about the local church. And so when the doors of that church opened, I was there. And when Cookie was, Cookie was basically on staff. I think she was a volunteer. Uh, but she, she did a lot of the training for the classes. She did dis discipleship classes and multiple other classes. And, and I was in every one of them. And I remember Cookie um, was one of the people that I remember, she looked at me differently. She didn't look at me like the old man that I was, the heroin addict. She looked at me like the new creation. She treated me with respect. She showed me the love um, that we're supposed to show each other. And it was like one of the things that fueled, uh, hey, maybe God's people love me too, just like God. You know, because the church isn't perfect. There's always going to be church hurt. But man, there's always going to be those people that just get it. 
and just love people really well without agenda. And I remember one time she made a joke in, in one of her classes that um, she said, Chad's in every one of my classes. And, um, and that's how we got to know each other. And so uh, finally, this was in Florence, and when I, I was moving back to Charleston, I was like, man, I really felt the call to do more for God. I wanted to get into ministry. I wanted to love people well. I wanted to see people get saved. And so one of my mentors actually reached out to Cookie and was like, hey, Chad's trying to figure this thing out. Can you just, can you have a phone call with him and try to figure it? And so we talked for, I don't know if you remember this, but we talked for 30 to 45 minutes and she encouraged me and she loved me. She treated me like the new creation that I was in Christ. And see, those seeds that are planted into people like us, the people of the second chance or what, help us realize that, hey, maybe God can use me. Hey, maybe God can do something with this old junkie because that's not who I am anymore. And see, people like Cookie, yeah, come on. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, people like Cookie um, are the people that show me that. And so uh, she's going to talk to you a little bit about her ministry, but her ministry is not unlike ours. It has the same heart for people that are hurting, um, and they're doing a really good job at what they're doing. And I think she's going to talk a little bit about that today. But I'm just so honored for her to join our family today and to be a part of what God is doing here. And I know that this message is going to bless you. Um, so let me pray for us, and I'm going to let Cookie come up. Jesus, you are so good. Thank you, Lord, for people like Cookie that believe in the people of the second chance, that believe in people that uh, the world all but gave up on, but she knows that won't God do it? Won't God save people? Won't God change people? If we really believe in this man named Jesus Christ that says that if you are in Christ, you are a new creation, that the old is gone and the new is here, will we really believe that? Well, people like Cookie do. And we are just so honored, Lord. We just pray that you would bless her. Um, and just speak through her tonight, Lord. And, and I just pray that you would open all the hearts in this room. And uh, Jesus, we just love you. Amen. Amen. is not a part of my past, but I am a wild one, and I love wild ones. Yes. Um, my, favorite place, my favorite place to share the gospel is the Florence County Detention Center, but I'm telling you, y'all are running a close second right now. Um, so, when I was about eight years old, and, and y'all help me, like, I like y'all to talk to me, and I might go as far as this core to let me go. Um, so y'all help me out. And when I was eight years old, I was spending the weekend with my aunt in Sumter. Y'all know where Sumter is? And we, she took us to a very fancy Sumter Speedway. <laughs> Dirt track. Yes. Yes. yes, got some amens out there. <laughs> um, and the infield, we were on the infield, and the infield was separated from the dirt track only by, by like a telephone pole, but like about three, four feet tall. And so they were just kind of staggered all around the infield. Now, looking back as an adult, I'm not sure who thought that was a good idea. <laughs> but, so my cousin and I escaped from my aunt, and we found the perfect place to watch the race. You going with me? Yeah. We found a little stump. So I sat on one, and he sat on one right beside me. Well, not too long after that, in this right turn, a car began to lose control. So it begins to spin, and all the people <coughs> start running to the back of the infield, including uh, myself and my cousin. And that very stump that I had been sitting on was plowed down by the spin out of that car. Sometimes people are like that in our lives. 
sometimes people are on a destructive spin out headed towards their own destruction and about to take out a few other folks with them. So there are big hurts, like the spin out kind of hurts. And then there are the little kind of hurts. I have two daughters. One is 17. Oh, wow. <laughs> yes, yeah, so y'all already praying for it. <laughs> 17 and 14. Now you get double the prayers. Yeah, thank you. Take a double portion. <laughs> um, but my little, my, my Campbell, she's the youngest. She was in 3K. And girlfriend, I do not know what her classmate did to her. But, you know, and I dressed her so cute, so she was had this just little cute little bow in her head, hair, and she was just looking all cute. But this little girl went to sit up at the table, and my precious heart just pulled that chair right out from my floor <laughs> so that she fell right on the floor. <laughs> that was the only time in her whole life that she got on yellow. Y'all know what it means to get on yellow. Uh, those of you who have kids, that means like you got a warning for being a bad girl. Um, so there are little hurts like that. And, you know, you might even think back over your life. The thing that somebody said to you that for whatever reason, it is still there. It just stuck. And they have no idea that they... You know, I'm afraid of that as a parent. Things that I have said that I had no idea just stuck in a place. So we got the spin out hurts. We got the mischievous chair pulling out kind of hurt. And then sometimes we got the hurt we created of our very own self. Yep. Uh -huh. That we just did it right to ourselves and we don't have anybody else to blame for it. And so I want to talk about hurt tonight. Isn't that a fun topic? Yeah. <laughs> I'm so excited she's talking about hurt. But let me tell you why. Because in my own life and in the lives that I have witnessed around me, I have seen more defeat at the hands of hurt. I have seen the enemy win greater victory by using hurt than just about anything else I can think of. And so I want to camp because um, I have the mission statement for our ministry, Tenacious Grace. We engage hurting women from all walks of life with the message of truth, strength, and hope in Jesus. But the important part I want you to, to pay attention to is Tenacious Grace engages hurting women. That's where, that's the campground we park our camper. Like we want to be in the hurt places. We're not, we're not called, and some people are, we, Tenacious Grace, are not called to people who have it all together and they're looking quite fine while they do it. <laughs> um, that is not where we live. We park in the parking lot of hurt. And so tonight, I just want to camp. And, and I named this message after um, some of our ladies. And, and I, just to give you just a tiny little bit about what we do, our ministry, we go into our local jail and we... Um, we have two, I'm a chaplain at our um, jail, and then we have another chaplain, a female chaplain that works with Tenacious Grace, and we share Jesus every time we go in, um, and then we have an office outside of that, so we give ladies our contact information, so once they are released, they then reach out to us in our office outside, and we begin, we help pay rent, we help remove obstacles in the name of Jesus for building and writing a new story with him. So that's what we do. And, but they have, they introduced me to a saying, and this is the title of my message. Feeling some type of way. <laughs> they will, you know, 
<laughs> if, if something, and I love it because it can mean a multitude of things. It can mean I'm mad. It can mean I'm upset. It can mean my feelings are hurt. But it just means that whatever has happened, whatever hurt has come my way, has me feeling some type of way. And it's so complex that I really can't pin it down. But I hope tonight that, and then here's the cool thing about talking about hurts, is I don't have to guess about, oh, well, maybe somebody in here has been hurt. <laughs> like I don't have to say, okay, raise your hand if you've been hurt. Because it is the universal, and maybe, you know, there's some camaraderie in laughing about the fact, okay, it's a universal part of the human experience. Yeah. Yeah. And I have found over the course of time that there are about four ways we try to deal with hurt. And the first that we try to do, let me make sure I get them in order. Oh, the first thing sometimes we do with our hurt is we wanna make sure the person who did that to us gets their due. Like, see, yeah, y'all like, amen. Like, y'all want me to come and y'all want me to say, all we gotta do is memorize this verse and we're gonna be good. <laughs> and here's the verse. If Let me know if you've ever memorized this in church in the past. I think it's Psalm 63, 10. They will be given over to the sword and become food for death. <laughs> Amen, yes. <laughs> we will have a memory check on that verse next week. <laughs> no, seriously, guys, my family and I went to um, Edisto this summer, and we went to church on the beach. And so it was about, like, 50 of us, and... and it was a, a, tra a traditional church, and <laughs> um, we had responsive reading. So my, my children aren't accustomed to responsive reading. But we stood up, and we're reading all of Psalm 63. And then we get to this part, and my kids are like, what are we saying? <laughs> but everybody is very formally saying, and become food for jackals. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the ways that we deal with hurt is we want revenge. We want to see people get their due. The second way we try to deal with our hurt. Now, all of these are not good ways, by the way, so don't take notes. Um, the second way is we try to run away from it. And I want to introduce you to my friend, Net. Net, this picture was taken around 6 a.m. after she had escaped out of a police car at 6 p.m., the night before. So, the same outfit you got. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whoa. Oh, that's kind of scary. <laughs> ten years ago. <laughs> scary. Oh. So, well, this was only two years ago. <laughs> but this picture captures her after um, she had convinced a rookie cop to roll down the window uh, in the back of the car. She had and she was thin um, and about, she's six feet tall, um, brought her handcuffs to the front, wow. was able to reach outside to make, because you can only open the door from the outside, clutched on when it swung open, dropped down and hid in the woods all night, handcuffed. And then in the morning she realized, well, this ain't gonna work out too. <laughs> so she went to the train tracks and just waited on them to come get her. So not only did she have a shoplifting charge, she then also had an escape charge. So we 
try to escape it, right? But just like with Net, it was still there. She still had to pay the piper. So we try to get revenge. We try to run away from it. Some of us women, now men, you may do this too, but I know women do it. We just try to manage it. We yes. just gonna manage it. <laughs> we got a calendar and we just gonna pencil it in right there and it's gonna stay right there and we are managers and we're just gonna manage it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and sometimes what this will look like is I got my little pot of pain. I'm just gonna stick it back there on the back burner. Yep. I, I got these eyes up here. I'm still cooking. I'm still doing my thing. But I got my pot of pain. And it's back there. The problem with that one is anybody knows what, what happens every now and then? Boil up. Boil over. over. Y'all know it. It will boil over. And we back there like putting that hand on that lid just trying to keep it. You just got to keep it in the pot. And then the other, the fourth thing, and this may be more um, of a woman thing too, is sometimes we just going to own it. Like, mm -mm, you don't get, we're not going to deal with it because I'm entitled to it. It's mine. I'm entitled to hold on to this thing. Who would I be if I didn't have this to hold on to that this was the hurt that somebody did to me? We're just going to be owning it. Don't try to talk me out of it. It's mine. But thankfully, thankfully, hurt is not new. In the Bible, there are beautiful, beautiful examples. And sometimes I think we can be really guilty of reading the Bible and making the people cardboard. Like not feeling what they felt. The purpose is for us to see how to live and follow Jesus. And the people who hurt in the Bible, it felt it feels just like it hurts, it feels when I hurt. But we'll read over a story and not think about the hurt attached in that story. Like Abraham and Sarah. Um, you don't have to know much about Abraham and Sarah, but they were married. They were going on a journey. Here's what, here's what Abraham does. He says, Sarah, we're going to Somerville. And when we get to Somerville, they're going to think you're really pretty. <laughs> and they're going to want to kill me so they can marry you. So when we get to Somerville, you tell them that you're my sister. What did you say? <laughs> <laughs> now, what kind of, if we can just unpack what kind of devaluing did that feel like to Sarah for her husband to say I'm going to save my hide so tell them you're my sister that hurt her or when we read about Leah and Rachel <laughs> Ooh. They were sisters and they were married to the same man. Yep. Bad idea. <laughs> Bad idea. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> yeah. Dad messed up on that one. Yeah, it's all day. You're right. <laughs> but here's the thing. The Bible, you can go and see God's word.
words where it says, God saw that Leah was not loved. Some of us probably got some hurt. I, I, I'll go first. <laughs> Attached to not feeling loved. And we can go to Hannah and Penaniah. They're again married to the same man. One could have babies, the other could not. And we are told that the one who could have babies was such a catty voice in Hannah's ear that she could not eat. She was so harassed. And it wasn't just women. Like Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, tells us, and I'm pretty sure it's 2 Timothy 1, 15, yep. He says, everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me. He had done many, years and years of ministry with lots of brothers in the faith. And it was time for him to go to court. And guess what? Everybody bounced. That hurts. But not only that... Jesus, yep. praise the Lord for a Savior Amen. who knows about hurt. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. That's good. If I know when he first starts preaching what his own family says, his family says we must go take charge of him because he is out of his mind. Your brothers show no support or belief. That hurts. He went to preach in his hometown. They tried to drive him off of a cliff. The people he went to school with, the people he played with, the ladies who were like second moms to him, those were the people in that church who drove him out and did not believe that he was a son of God. Can't you imagine that the man part of him, of all the people he wanted to believe in him, it would have been those that he loved. But there is documentation that they did not believe. That they rejected him, that they scoffed at him, they mocked him. These are not the people who persecuted him. These were the people in his family. Then, we, of course, we have Judas. But I think even more heartbreaking than Judas, we have Peter. I think the most gut wrench, one of the most gut wrenching verses in the Bible is when Peter denies the Lord, and it says, in that moment, Jesus looked at him, and he got up, ran out, weeping. Church hurt is not new. <laughs> Been having a long time. And the enemy will use it. Let's be wise. Let's be shrewd about our hurt and especially about our church hurt. So we have a Savior who knows what that feels like. And I think he models for us how to deal with hurt in a healthy way. And the first place we see that is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And we see in Matthew. Yes. So 
in Matthew, I think I have slides for that actually. Yep. So here's what I think Jesus models for us first is that pain needs an honest voice. That's my favorite thing about going to jail. There's no pretense in jail. Everybody knows you in jail. Everybody knows you didn't follow Jesus there. So, there is no pretense in jail. I love it. It is actually why it is my favorite place to be. And so the ladies I have met are really good at giving their pain an honest voice. But I think what we see in Jesus, in Matthew 26, 38, he is in the garden and he says, I am deeply grieved to the point of death. He said that for us. He didn't have to tell anybody that that's what he was feeling. He didn't put on a church face and say, glory to God. He said, I am deeply grieved. And he said that so that when you are deeply grieved, you know you have a Savior who identifies, who felt that very same thing. Come on. Amen. That verse is for you, and that verse is for me. And then when he goes to the cross in Matthew 27, 46, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Probably the most honest verse in the Bible. Now, we know that God has to turn away from sin, but this is what Jesus was feeling in that moment. And that verse is for you. So that when you feel forsaken and you feel rejected and you feel abandoned, you know that you have a Savior who also did. So I think the first thing, if hypothetically we had some hurt we needed to deal with, the first thing would be giving our pain. It requires it. Our pain requires an honest voice. And then secondly, I think the thing that will change how we deal with our hurt is when we begin to look for God in it. Because here's what we want to do, right? Our hurt makes me focus on That is why I believe it is such an effective tool of the enemy. It makes me look at me and what I feel, and I'm feeling some kind of way, and these are my <laughs> circumstances, and I don't like my circumstances. And really, if we're not careful, we will just drown in me, me, this is hurting me. One of God's main aims for us is to make, to transform us to be more like Jesus, right? Would you agree with that? Well, Satan is a counterfeiter. So anything that God does, he has a counterfeit version for. So God, will, I mean, God wants to take our hurt and heal it and use it to make us more like Jesus. The enemy wants to take our hurt and make us wallow in it and make us selfish in it and make us focus on ourselves, which ends up making us more like him. We've got to be careful stewards of our hurt because the enemy is after it for his own purposes. So if we will take our hurt and look for the Lord in it and ask him, hey, God, what's true here? <laughs> for some reason in my life, I guess it's because I do some speaking, 
there have been several instances where people would just email me about the fact that they don't like me. Um, <laughs> it's an interesting thought. I mean, I've never thought to do that. Um, <laughs> it really, like, I can honestly say, thankfully, the way I'm wired, it doesn't really bother me because it would bother me a lot more if they knew me. I mean, they don't know me, so they what they don't like is what they think I am, and they so that's okay. But what I will do is to go and ask the Lord, okay, what's true about this? Is there anything in here that you want to change about me? And perhaps there was some purpose in this communication because I need to know if something is true about this. And take it to the Lord as an instrument of transformation. Like, what's true here? Because sometimes also, and let's say it's not an email where somebody doesn't like you, but let's say it's an altercation or a hurt in a relationship. We say, okay, what's the truth here? Was this person really out to get me? Probably not. Like really getting away from our feelings and asking the Lord, show me the truth. Show me the truth in this hurt. And then secondly, where's the glory? Lord, how can you be glorified in this? Because that takes what the enemy wants to use for selfishness and turns it to be an instrument of glory for the Lord in our own transformation. So, pain needs an honest voice. And then we need to look for the Lord in our hurt. And I think as we are wrapping up, I would bet that all of us fall into one of three camps. And I want to break that down for you a little bit. But first, I forgot to read a verse that I wanted to share with you. And I'm older than y'all, so I have to put on this. Um, this is about Jesus and how he dealt with his hurt. Um, and it's out of 1 Peter 2. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. So I think right in that verse, we find Jesus modeling. Hey, he didn't retaliate. He didn't hurl insults. He entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. And so in thinking about three camps, I think, and I spent a year in Christian counseling every week. I'm a, I'm a big fan. Amen. So some of us maybe have come from the broken places, but we've really pursued how to handle hurt in a healthy way. Some of us probably know that we need to pursue finding how to deal with hurt in a healthy way. And then thirdly, there may be some of us in here who need to ask the Lord into our lives before we start working on the hurt. Because let me tell you, without Jesus, pain is just pain. Amen. There is no purpose in it. Wow. Yeah. There is Amen. no healing from it. Amen. And the rest of that verse I was just reading to you says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. 
by his wounds you have been healed. The only healing, the only real, true, complete healing comes from Jesus. That's right. And yes. so if you do not have a relationship with Jesus, you are you cannot pursue complete and full healing apart from him. That's right. So that is the first step. So I want to share with you, my heart is that healed hearts are far more useful to the kingdom than wounded worshipers. There is work we need to do for the advancing of the gospel. This is net today. The same day. loves Jesus. If you drive into Florence, she is going to be walking down the street praising the Lord. She would praise the Lord so viciously in jail that I was scared the CO was going to kick me out. Um, this woman loves the Lord and is writing a new story. She was in a domestic violent relationship used to numb herself in that situation, but now she is doing amazing. She has a job the first time in 10 years. Wow. And she, my friends, is advancing the kingdom. Gotcha. I'm gonna allow Chad to um, wrap us up, but thank you, thank, thank you. you. I will be gotcha. in the back if um, anybody needs um, to come talk or pray. Um, with some other awesome people. Awesome. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
to, 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 to numb it. What is it that you put over that boiling pot in your life? Jesus can remove that boiling pot from your stove and give you a fresh oven to cook Thanksgiving dinner. Come on. Yes. Yeah, it's still Thanksgiving, right? So I want to ask for you today, don't walk out of here today without knowing who Jesus is. Romans 10, 9 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And I share this verse a lot because it's one of my favorite verses in the whole entire Bible it's because I grew up in a church and I don't ever remember learning about grace, about real freedom. Um, and that verse tells me that if I confess with my heart, my mouth, that Jesus Christ is Lord, and I believe in my heart with that mustard seed of faith that God raised him from the dead, that I will be saved. When I turn away from that life that I've been living and turn towards a perfect Savior, hey guys, and I'm still turning every day. I have to turn every day, all right? So it's not a one-time thing, and oh, I'm fixed. You have to flesh out your salvation, but you have to start somewhere. So as the band comes up today, I just want to ask everybody in this room, do you know Jesus? Guys, the reason we do this every week, the reason that we found this place on Friday, cleaned it out on Saturday, and tried to fix it up on Monday is because we knew that there are people in our city that are hopeless because they don't have the hope of Jesus Christ. We don't want to miss one opportunity to tell you how good our Father is, how good Jesus is. Yo, it's the best thing I've ever done. I'm a Jesus junkie. All right? I am a Jesus junkie. And I want that for you, too. I want you to be on fire like that. Keep coming around here, man, and I promise you it will happen. So today I would ask you, if that's you, man, we're just going to pray together for the benefit of those who are coming to Christ today. And basically what we're going to say is what I just said, is you're believing with your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, that God raised him from the dead. Hey, guys, and 500 people saw this man walking after he was raised from the dead. All right, this is, this is not a fairy tale. This is fact, all right? This is history. So um, I always tell people today it would take me more faith to be not a Christian than to be a Christian because God is so real. People always ask me, well, if God is so real, why doesn't he open up the sky and show himself? I've heard this so many times. I said, well, he did 2,000 years ago and we put him on a criminal's cross <laughs> and we murdered him. But when he was on that cross, there was a man over to his side that was just a, had lived a horrible life and was, was dying. And he said, man, save me. I feel like I was that guy. I was at the end of my rope. I was at the end of my life. And I was on that side of Jesus. And I felt like I, I had put myself on a cross of my own making. And I was ready to die. And I, said, I looked over at Jesus and I said, save me. I don't know much of the Bible. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't have all the answers, but I know I do want to turn away from those old ways that I was living, and I want to turn towards a perfect Savior, and I want to trust you. I want to trust you for my salvation. So we're just going to pray together today. Hey, and if you're a Christian, pray with me. It never hurts to tell Jesus who he is. So we're just going to do what Romans 10 and I says as we bow our heads. We're going to say, Jesus, I confess that you are Lord. I believe that God raised you from the dead. I turn away from my sins. Lord, now all the hurt can be repaired. Jesus, thank you for saving me. And with heads bowed and eyes closed, man, if you just prayed to receive Jesus, and we're not going to call you out or anything, but we like to celebrate when God saves people. So I just ask you to raise your hand on the count of three. One, two, three. Just go ahead and raise your hand. Amen. I see you, brother. Thank you, Jesus. I see you, brother. We have two. Mm, come on. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come and so as we lift our, our heads back up, I just wanna I wanna look you right in the face. If you just if you just pray to receive Jesus, and I want to tell you, welcome. Welcome to the family. You were welcome before, but now you're a brother. Now you're a sister. It says in the word of God that angels in heaven are partying right now. Because, hey, come on, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It, says, 
You may have come in here with a with a jaded past, and man, you're like, but Chad, I've got all this hurt. It's going to take years and years and years to repair this. And I say, yeah, it probably will. But today is the starting block. It says in Second Corinthians five seventeen that you're a new creation today. That you are brand new. But one thing that I know is if you walked in here a heroin addict today, the only thing that's going to change about you tomorrow morning is you're going to wake up a heroin addict who knows Jesus. And so I tell you that because Jesus can heal in a second. He can heal in a moment. But in my experience and what I've seen is Jesus likes to see you flesh it out. He wants you to learn. He wants you to learn what that looks like. And I'll tell you what, man, it's so crazy because... If he would have healed me in a second and taken away everything, I wouldn't have been hungry to be around people like Cookie that were willing to invest in me and teach me and disciple me. And so that's the great thing about it. So I'll tell you today, man, flesh it out. Keep coming back every week. Learn from people who have been through what you've been through. Every person in this room, I look around and I see a whole lot of amazing miracles, amazing stories. I know probably half of the people in this room, I remember when you got saved and when you got baptized. That's exciting. So what we get to do every week on Monday nights, guys, is we get to gather and we get to be family. We get to be vulnerable. We get to be real. We get to be our real selves. And I love what Cookie said about going into jails because people are real. They've got nothing to hide. They didn't follow Jesus to jail. No. And a lot of us didn't follow Jesus to the Hope Project. We ended up here because a friend invited us, or we stumbled in, and, and then that one day we were like, I, I can just be my real self. This isn't church. I'm just going to say how I feel. And you raise your hand, and then you're like, oh, I'm going to keep coming back. I can think of multiple people in this room that was that person that just happened to end up here, and now you've continued to come back. Hey, if you receive Jesus today, man, I would I would ask for you to take a step of faith. We're, next week we're doing baptism. We believe that baptism... Uh, is an outward display of an inward change. So basically your next step after salvation is baptism. It's going public with your faith in Jesus Christ. I want to challenge you to come back that next week and do that. We've got a sign up in the back if you'd like to sign up. We want to celebrate with you though. One thing I always tell our volunteers is we want to out celebrate the angels because they're always celebrating. That's a good goal, right? I want to out celebrate them. Um, so today, if you receive Jesus today, we got volunteers moving to the back right now, man. They want to pray with you. They want to pray for you. Um, we'd love to maybe get some information from you and follow up with you. Um, because like I said, what we know is today is a starting block. It's not the finish line. No, I am. Today is, is, is the beginning of fleshing out that salvation. And so, hey, and if you came in here today and you're dealing with some hurt, you're dealing with some stuff that you put on that back burner. I love that analogy. You put on that back burner, it's kind of bubbling up. And you need the hope of Jesus. And maybe you already got it, but you just need prayer. Man, go ahead and get up out of your seat and go to the back right now, man. We want to pray with you. Hey, we believe that where two or more are gathered, there God will be. So we believe that God will meet you in the back and he will be with you as people pray over you. Don't miss this opportunity. Guys, we do this. Because we want to love you well. So go ahead and get up out of your seat right now. Go ahead and head to the back and get some prayer. Don't be shy. Come on. Come on, people. I'm about to head to the back and get some prayer myself. If I can do it, you can do it. Let me pray for us. Jesus, you are so good. Thank you so much for everyone in this room. Thank you for the two people that you snatched out of hell and that you saved, and that you redeemed. God, thank you for what you say about every person in this room that is Christian, that we are brand new, <laughs> that we, we are sanctified, we are justified, <laughs> we are new creations, we are beautiful in your eyes. When you see us, you see a bloodstained cross, you see the glory of Jesus Christ, you don't see our sin anymore, you see Jesus. God, we thank you for that. We thank you that we don't have to be good enough that you were good enough 2,000 years ago on a criminal's cross. God, I just pray that if somebody in here today, I know there are some hearts in here that are hurting and they need prayer. God, I just pray that you would give them the courage to get up out of their seat right now and not waste this moment that they can have someone pray with them and for them. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for doing work tonight. We thank you for Cookie. We pray that you would bless her ministry. Um, just bless her. God, thank you so much for the amazing message that she brought. And uh, Jesus, we just love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Because I trust you 
group for our small groups. And our small groups consist of recovery groups for women overcoming addiction, recovery group for men overcoming addiction. We have a codependency support group similar to Amazon. <coughs> we also have a um, community that meets that just needs people to gather around them and understand what community is. And we also have um, a new believers support group. So if you come back next Monday night, you will get the opportunity to choose between one of those groups that best fits your needs and where you're at in your walk um, in your recovery. And if you're not in a recovery and just seeking um, community, we have that available. Um, so tonight we're going to be doing something a little different than we usually do. Um, we will be combining all the groups together. My group has been discussing how to navigate the stress of the holidays um, and how to walk through your recovery um, and doing community with people who might be in recovery or not so much. And so we're going to be combining all the groups together. My, Chad's, Matt's, Kelsey's, Taylor's, and Barb's will all be meeting here in this room. And tonight we are going to be talking about um, how to cope with that stress and the survival guide to Christmas. So if you are staying for the support group, we'll be taking a short break, smoke break if you need to do that, um, lining up for the one restroom that we have available. <laughs>